Welcome to the official Jets podcast. Eric Allen here inside the studio with Joe Klecko, who moves one step closer to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, one of three senior finalists. Can you take me through your reaction when you got that call? Well, it was a, a, a mediocre type reaction at the point because I had told my wife, and we have gone through this for so many mm. years now, that uh, you know everybody was uh, painting a, a rosy picture. And of course, yeah, oh, Joe, I got the feeling this is it, this is it. And I never give in to that. So actually, when the time came, I, I was busy. I kept myself busy on purpose because, you know, this year uh, the Hall of Fame actually changed the format of three seniors being voted in. So it was a much better chance because I was a pretty good finalist last year um, when Cliff Branch got elected. And I was close, you know, but... You know, I got the, I got that call that time where everybody said would probably be the call, and it didn't work out. So I wasn't expecting really too much because I didn't want myself to get too high over the whole thing because, listen, it, this is awesome. But when I got the call from Porter from the Hall of Fame, uh, uh, Gary Myers, who was my advocate there, Gary said to me, are you going to be emotional? I said, no. I said, no, I'm not going to be emotional. And... Uh, it was it was it was really funny because the minute he said it, you know, uh, my wife, who is a very reserved lady, is, is is you know in the background. Her and I were the only two at home, and she's jumping up and yelling, "Finally, finally!" And uh, uh, at the point when Jim said it, you know, it, the emotions hit me, and it was uh, it was a very surreal moment. It was like uh, never thought it would happen. You know, over the years, I've been waiting now for. What is it? Almost 30 years mm. since the day I retired. And, you know, I was on the ballot in the regular time. And then on the senior ballot, I've been there forever and very close many times. So uh, it was a great feeling. It was like it really was a, a load off. It was like it's like somebody shot me almost the relief <laughs> I got, you know, after he said, you know, that, Joe, you're one of the finalists. And I went, oh, that's great. You know, and uh, it was it was a good moment. Yeah. You said 30 years since you've been out of the game yeah. and waiting for that call. Mm -hmm. um, just the emotion in terms of everything that you've been through year after year, can you take us back what it was like waiting for the call and to hear other people get nominated? And then, like you said, you probably got to wonder, hey, it's, is it ever going to come? Well, you know, and... Uh, Believe it or not, I I listen to my wife more than people think I do, you know, and she's a very good, you know, uh, uh, decipher of of rhetoric, and uh, you know all the people over the years, and of course this is New York, and you know I know a lot of the media and the team and everybody else, and it was always Joe, don't worry, you're there, you're gonna, and you know you'd hear that year after year, and and if, especially in the beginning. When I was on the the, the regular players uh, a nomination yeah, the modern day. to be the modern day, I made the last fifteen I think twice, you know, and of course those days, you know, once you got the last fifteen, your hopes really got high because you know they take up the five, and you know I was hoping and hoping and hoping, but uh, you know the call never came, and uh, this year, you know, uh, not letting myself expect it. I really wasn't. This year, you know, and I think the past four years that have led up to this, you know, I've had a lot of great feedback from people and stuff to where, Joe, I know this is the year, you know, like they had the, you know, the silver, the, the crystal ball. But uh, my wife actually said, she goes, you know, Joe, she goes, I don't know. And of course, she doesn't know. But uh, she said, I have a different feeling this year. And I said, well, Let's keep it under wraps until something happens. But, uh, you know, she was right. And, uh, you know, as a prognosticator, she's usually pretty good. And uh, up to now, she was, you know. And, you know, she always said to me, Joe, maybe the Lord doesn't want you there. I says, well, I says, he's, he, he's got command of pretty a lot of things down here. So <laughs> if he wants it, it'll happen. So I guess, you know, I finally got the touch. And uh, she actually said, you know, I had that feeling about this one. It was a good one. Can you open the champagne yet, though? Because 
you got to get 80 percent of the vote in january <laughs> exactly <laughs> and, and no i can't you know okay because you know uh you know maintaining that possibility of not still exists you know i mean it doesn't happen very often it has happened hmm. but it, it doesn't happen very often and uh what bothers me actually about that is when you have one guy who's the nominee which has been in the past it's it's kind of easy to just rubber stamp that guy and put him in but now you have three guys you know and there's sentimental emotions for guys who've been waiting a long time and of course you know, one of the guys is deceased now, and Chuck Halley is the other one. And, you know, Chuck's 86 years old, I think, you know. So, you know, I always I always create this scenario in my head that I'm going to be the one left out of it. So, no, I, I, I can't give in to it yet. I, I can't give in. I'm very happy. And we all, they all talk about, you know, uh, it's, it's just a, a you know, the word, it, it's – a foregone conclusion, right? You know that it's going to happen. Not me. I'm, I'm going to maintain my stability in that it may not happen, and then when it does, I can let loose. I, I can say it's going to happen. It <laughs> should happen. It's long overdue. Um, Carl Lawson, who is a edge rusher here with the New York Jets, who Jets fans are really excited to see him on the field in the regular season. He talked to the media the other day and he said, no offense to you guys, but I don't really get caught up in the praise I get from the media. It's more so from the guys I played against. Can you speak to that? Because one of the things over the years that I was taken aback by when doing work on you because I came in here with in the organization in 2001. I didn't get a chance to see you play every Sunday. But talking to your peers and guys who are in the Hall of Fame who lined up against you said, hands down, he should be in the Hall of Fame, and it's a slur that Joe, uh, Joe Clack was not in the Hall of Fame. Well, and I agree to, to that point about the press, and the press can build you up, and the press can tear you down. So if you allow yourself to get caught into that, you know, uh, I guess that comes from being that working class family, uh, you know, the working class, you know, where, you know, you did your best at your job and even harder because you didn't know if you were going to have a job. You know, so uh, I, I never gave in to anybody's rhetoric about, you know, oh, Joe, you should be... But I always said what you said is all the guys I played against know what I did, you know. And like you said, the guys that spoke up for me recently and in, in the, the uh, John Hanna's, uh, uh, Joe DeLon, Joe DeLon Malour, Malour, Howie and Long, Howie, and then uh, Dwight Stevenson just spoke about it. Yep. And, uh, of course, uh, Anthony Munoz, uh, you know, always talked about, referred me and hit Fred Dean were the two – toughest people that he ever played against. That comes from two guys that are considered, the, I think, the top first in 100 years of, of professional football at their position. And Stevenson, you know, may be one of two that are there. I'd say that carries a pretty good amount of validity, you know, that, uh, you know, he wasn't a bad player. <laughs> uh, you weren't a bad player, but – when we talk about those guys, that speaks to Joe Klecko because defensive end, defensive tackle, and then I thought maybe one of your most impressive things that you did from a position perspective was playing the nose. Um, how much did you pride yourself on the versatility and also being a team player and being, hey, asked to do something different a number of times throughout your career and not only saying you're going to do it but excelling at it well that was a that position change there when bud carson came in as a as a defensive coordinator uh he had joe green with the steelers in a four-man line and joe played that cock nose position where you know joe was pretty unstoppable his whole career and getting off the ball was one of Joe's fortes and all. And so he started it, you know. And then when he gave it to me, I played it in a three-man line. Mm -hmm. But one of the great things that Bud allowed me to do is 
he allowed me – I had the two A-gaps to cover, you know, from either if I cocked on the left or the right side. I still had to cover both A-gaps. But uh, I gave a lot of people so many fits because Bud Carson gave me the leeway. When I moved to nose, I didn't think too much about, you know, I wasn't going to make this, you know – into a, a stardom role because of, oh my God, you know, a nose tackle is fodder. You know, you're getting there to take blocks for the linebackers to make plays. <laughs> yeah. But then as he allowed me to play it in a certain way, oh, I, I just, I turned loose. I mean, you know, when you game plan against a team, you know, they're right-handed, left-handed, they run the ball here in certain formations and so forth. And I would go against that grain. And Bud would say, Joe, why did you do that? I said, Bud, look at the line, look at the, the running back. I said, what's that? He's looking at the hole. And he'd run the film and he'd see, he goes, that's why I, he always wanted me per game plan, if they were right-handed to, with a tight end, to stay to that side or to stay to the other side, you know, and wreak havoc whatever I could by coming off the ball real hard. But I said to him, I says, you know, you know, and you always watch film and, you know, the little things you pick up, you know, you got to use in a game like a, one of the guys that was a guard here uh, years ago, Teddy Banker, I helped him so much in the process, and we'd be practicing against each other. I said, Teddy, you're pulling. He goes, how do you see that? How do you know that? How do you, you know, and I said, Teddy, you, Teddy, you can't set like that. You're, you're going to set. I said, I'm going to run you over. He goes, how do you know? You know, and it's just the things you pick up over the years being a, being a player that it really helped you. And, and really, the greatest thing, and I never, ever said this to anybody, is the quarterback is an allowed an advantage step. The quarterback under center can pull out his right foot before the ball is snapped. Well, if, you, if you're a nose tackle in a cock position, that big gap that you have between the guard and the center, the first thing I'm looking at is the feet of the quarterback. And Marino was, the, was very good at getting out early because he used that. Well, it also, I didn't let to be known but <laughs> it was an advantage for me because I would I would take off on their foot not on the ball and the thing about it was is I you know I anticipated a lot of things and I knew where the ball was going most of the time or if it was a, or they were throwing a ball so it gave me that great advantage to get off the ball oh, we could speak for hours we could speak for days we have uh so many times over the years with that being said let's just get to a couple things here 81 what was that like? 20 and a half sacks, first guy to 20, and also playing not just along <laughs> with your sack exchange teammates, but across town, Lawrence Taylor was having a pretty good year himself, right? Sure, yeah. yeah. How you much know, did you monitor that? <laughs> well, you were doing you know, your damage. You know, uh, I think later in that, in, that, in that year or something like that, I think it was Sports Illustrated did, 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 had an article in it um, – heart and soul of New York football. And they had me as the heart and, and, and Lawrence as the soul, you know. And, uh, you know, going back and forth during that year, you know, people compared his, his ability to do things. And he was young. It was, I don't know if it was rookie year or not. Uh, it might have been. But, uh, you know, uh, I told him at the time I made the AFC defensive player of the year and he made the NFL defensive player of the year. I said, how could you give it to a rookie? You know, it's, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, that was something we talked about back then, even because of that article of heart and soul of the New York football. What do you like playing best out of the three positions? <laughs> Believe it or not, I like to play nose tackle yeah. because it, first of all, I was, I was footloose and fancy free. I could do whatever I want. And I was, you know, quick enough and strong enough to do whatever I wanted with the offensive line inside. I mean, believe me, there's times that, you know, I got tied up. and But there's times I tied up three people sometimes, too, you know, which made it easy for everybody behind me. Uh, defensive end, of course, I love the freedom to run up field and you're going to throw the football. But, you know, you better ha- – pay attention to me inside you know about sacks because you know I mean I would make if you left me on with the center I had my 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 way but they always had a double team and they had to because basically the center was especially of his own his right hand he was right hand snapper you know he was at a disadvantage right away but I enjoyed the nose tackle position the most 
Yeah, but I get mad when people just talk about you and the first thing they say is sex. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's great. He did get to the quarterback. But when you look at those run numbers where the Jets ranked with the rush defense, it, even you playing the nose, it was right up there because you're penetrating, you're getting to the quarterback, but the guys behind you, butts, Greg Buttle, Lance Mel, he was a pro bowler the yeah. one year. Yeah. And you saw the Jets' rush defense. You got hurt, I think it was late in 86. Mm -hmm. Your rush defense was number one in the National Football League when you were playing nose tackle. Right. Well, the thing about it was is I always – Listen, them guys are going to have more view of everything is because they're standing up. And the one thing I would never let happen, and they, you see it called today a good bit too, is I drag guys down. I would let if I knew kind of where it was going. And the snap of the ball, you could feel everything. So if the guard was trying to get off of me to get to the linebacker, I usually had him tied up. But if I didn't. I mean, I mean, grab him by the belt, by his pads, whatever it was. I pulled him down. Yeah. Because then I, I remember John Woodring, who was one of the middle linebackers backup that played with us, and we're up against New England, and, and I got in the game. And uh, I was hurt the first two games. Sometime I was – why I wasn't in there, I don't remember. But uh, I came in the game, and first thing was a toss, you know, outside. And I wouldn't let – I got pulled the guard down, and, and Woodring's running by me going, way to go, click! You know, <laughs> and he, he runs by me. And, you know, I was into keeping them guys clean more than they knew. And Lance Mel, you know, Lance played behind me for yep. a few years. And Lance absolutely enjoyed that freedom that I gave him because I would not let – and they – if they figured out they were going to try and block me with a tight end, that was a joke. You know, so if they figured out they had to double me, then it made his life that much easier. And, uh, and, uh, and as long as they stayed on me, I mean, he had freedom. He would run. All defensive linemen talk about the importance of hands. Can you talk about your amateur boxing background and how that may have helped you? And also, well, let's start there before we get to a guy by the name of Jim Jones from Poland University. <laughs> well, hands, you know, I, I watch nowadays that, you know, so many guys teach it, the coaches and everything like that. And uh, I remember getting, I was talking to, I'm not going to tell you who they were, a couple of defensive line coaches, you know, that were in the NFL that kind of, I says, you can't do that. I says, if you do this with your hands, this and that, he goes, I says, you'll win every time and you'll do good. And uh, they would dispute it. You got to come off the ball. I says, you move your feet first, you're dead. What? That's, you know, that was the teaching of ever. Get off the ball, you know, and with your feet. No, if if you come off the ball and you make the wrong step and the, the, the guard or attacker or center makes the right step, you're already out basically two steps from where you have to go. Right. So, But if your hands come out first and you catch up to them and you read them, you're in front of them, you're knocking them down, you're way ahead of the game. Hands also pass rushing. What's the biggest thing that offensive linemen want to do? They want to stick you in the shoulder. And, you know, they'll tell you these areas in the pad are handles. They're, they're meant to hang on to. And that's the game today. They get you and they hold on. Now you see all these great pass rushers. You know, uh, Watt, you know, his big thing is hands. And uh, Boza, the whole thing with hands. Yep. And Aaron Donald, everything's about hands, you know. And it's amazing. Like I said, I think. I was trying to tell these guys these things years ago. Do you remember uh, Dan Radakovich, who coached with us here for years? Bad Rad was the coach for the Steelers during the 70s in the offensive line. And he's the one that started the shirts and, and being, tying them up so you couldn't grab them and all. And uh, uh, when Rad came here with me, my hands were exceptionally and quick because all I ever did one of my, in my workouts is I punched a bag. Always punched a heavy bag. And – Red came in and he's in a meeting one day and he goes, I can't believe it. I goes, what's that? And he goes, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who has, I went home last night, he said. And I said, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who has the greatest hands of all? And that mirror always said, bad ride. Last night it said Joe Klecko. I was done. <laughs> uh, what were you like as a boxer? Uh, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I had one, I lost one fight, you know, and then, uh, uh, but I had a friend of mine, Jack Merkendandy, who was a pro fighter that I worked with years ago, and he started me as a kid and all. And, you know, it's nice to punch bags and all and go in the gym and, and punch a bag, 
But it's different when you get punched. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when you get punched, you learn to protect yourself a lot more. And, uh, you know, I, I sparred a lot with Jerry Cooney. And uh, I had my times, you know, that I was with professional fighters a lot. And you learn how tough you're not because – if anybody's a pro fighter walking that street, he ain't worried about nobody else. Yeah. Because he's good at what he does. But, uh, you know, the one thing that I always uh, worked on was actually people hitting me because you learn how to protect yourself. And that makes your hands faster. And then, of course, punching the backs. But uh, it was a, a skill that I learned by getting punched. And that was the best part. Speaking of fighting, six round pick out of Temple. So you go there to Hofstra, first training camp. Your mentality was what? Well, my mentality was I was a little upset that I was drafted in the sixth round. And uh, my mentality was that uh, if I don't make this team, you're going to know I was here for some reason or another. So, uh, you know, uh, the dispute of anybody on the field holding and so forth you know, I never let that happen. And I was in a few scuffles in my time. But uh, You were in some early scuffles, though, correct? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I Listen, I was never going to let anybody get away with anything. And if it, whether it brought the attention of the coaches or not, I was going to let them know what kind of person I was on the field. Now, off the field, I was a different guy. But on the field, I was, I was not going to be – I was not going to be to toyed with, as you say. Yeah, for uh, some of our younger – Viewers and listeners right now checking out the podcast. Who was Jim Jones from Poland University, and how was this character created? Well, uh, when I left high school, I didn't get any offers to go to college, you know. And then uh, the, the greatest story about it is how I, I started, and I'll do this real quick, <laughs> is uh, I was at a softball game one time, and a fellow came up that was coaching a Sandlot semi-pro football team and he said to me Joe a lot of guys from your ex classes and some other guys are come out why don't you come out so I did I went out to the practice field and uh, uh, I pulled up my car and I was a very very timid guy it really was and I said I'm not going out there and my wife at the time my girlfriend took my keys out of the ignition and threw them out the window and I looked at her and I said why did you do that and more explicit than that. Sure. But, uh, she said, you got to go get them. So she knew if I went out there to get them, they would see me. And the guy come over, Joe, Joe, come on. I said, oh. And I looked back at her like, wait till I get back. I'll, you know. And needless to say, that was the beginning of Jim Jones. What it was was the owners of the team came up to me and said, Joe, we're not going to put your name in the program just in case you have a chance to go back to college because some guys on that team got paid. And it was a professional, it was called the Professional Seaboard League. And he, they said that, you know, if, if, if there's a problem, you're not going to be able to go to college. So they said, why don't you go under Jim Jones from Poland University? Not me, I didn't know no better. Is it? That sounds great. So Jim Jones was born on the Sandlot, on the practice field of the uh, Aston Knights. How crazy is that looking back now with all the social media? Like, you'd never be able to pull something off like that again. Oh, today, no. <laughs> they, they, they know your jock size, where you come from, where you were born, everything. Today, there's so much coverage and stuff. But uh, as it went down, you know, and the problem of it is, is, you know, nobody really picked. I did have a problem with it in college, though. The NCAA did look into it, but it was squashed and there was no problem but today you'd never get away with that did they hold that against you do you think you can't get in the voters minds but I think over the years people had said to me that well maybe he doesn't have a ring but it was Super Bowl ring. but when I look at your career what I think people forget is that the Jets had such a wide gap of not even making the postseason and you became part of of a team, of a culture where you guys got back in the mix and you were in the postseason a number of times. You're talking about like 11, 12 years consecutively. The Jets had not been in the postseason before you started there. Right. Well, the thing about it was with us, I think from a defensive standpoint, you know, and, and I think it carried over to our offense, especially in a defensive standpoint, you know, when we became the sack exchange, we actually pulled on the identity into our defense, mm -hmm. you know, and basically it's great to know really as a defensive back that, They've got three seconds or less to get rid of this thing, you know, because we're going to have 
our way with the quarterback. And that made a big deal of our guys taking chances. Like if you talk to uh, – uh, Kenny Schroer, Dow Ray, who were the safeties at that time, you know, you, you, you know, you're playing, you know, whether it be two or one coverage or whatever, and you're always backpedaling to make sure nobody's behind you. You know, you can take chances on jumping certain routes and stuff that they were privy to throw because we were going to have either them on the run or on his back. And that, that was a big deal. And that, that passed over to our offensive line. You got to remember, they had a practice against yeah. us every day. And, you know, unlike today, I don't know how many two days you run, but, you know, we had six weeks of two days. We came out during the week and we had, we had live pass protection, you know, every single day almost. And that made our offensive line really damn good because, not for naught, having to bar, block the four of us was a lot harder than a lot of teams they would come against. And I just think the mentality of our defensive line took over for the team and made it better. Two quick ones, because we got to let you go out to practice. New York Sack Exchange, when you hear that phrase, that term, what immediately comes to mind? A smile, really, because, yeah. you know, uh, a catchy name, a great time. You know, we, we came this close to breaking the sack record back then. I don't even know what it is now. I think we had in that year 68 or 69 sacks or something like that. And uh, we, we missed it by one or something of a team for not ha having the record. But nobody has ever done, too, what Mark and I did as far as two guys on the same team having 20 sacks. And understanding that they threw the ball back then 25% of the time to now they throw the ball 70% mm -hmm. of the time. You know, that, that, that has a lot to say for what the sack exchange was. And you got to remember, too, they didn't get away with running draws and things like that because Marty and Abdul covered it up for us so well that we could turn it loose, you know. And, you know, you, know, you can't let them outside here or something like that. Well, we would take the chances to where if we knew we can get there, we would – break the rules, as you say, as far as defensive play goes. But when you talk about the sack exchange, everybody knows who it is. Yeah. Uh, and what do you think about this guy out here, Robert Sala? I ask you that because I think you would have loved playing for him because everything that he talks about is impacting the quarterback, playing defensive violently. And when he was speaking about a rookie the other day, he said, you have to go through people. Joel Clacko always could go through people. Yeah, it was well. The thing about it is, is you know, defensive football should be intimidation. It should, and you're not going to be intimidating by somebody by you know taking the short route out. You know, making somebody pay a price on the field against you is basically what you want. And as far as far as him as a head coach, I mean, when he got the head coaching job, I talked to a lot of guys which. You know, the announcers are on, in the world are all friends of mine. And I talked about him. And, you know, we heard a lot because they were in the playoffs a lot. As far as the defense quarter, the coordinator, he, he got a great nod. But the one thing they talked about with me, with him, was he always had these guys ready to play for him. He, he is, you know, uh, as far as a motivator, he goes, his defensive guys would run for a wall for him. And I think that's. The one thing I said since day one, you can go back and look at interviews with me ever, the one thing a head coach has to do is get you ready to play. If he never touches the, the X's and O's, if he has you ready to tear down the walls before you walk out onto that field, you got a chance. Well, you got a hell of a chance, sir. Joe Clacko, one of three senior finalists for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It's going to happen in January. That vote takes place when you're going to get 80% of the vote. And then we're going to see you in Canton in 2023. I can't wait to watch you put on the jacket. Great seeing you. Thanks, man. And I can't wait either.